Why are young people in North America dying to be thin? Today on Context, we're looking at eating disorders. It's about dying to be thin. As millions of young women are struggling with eating disorders, researchers look to pop culture and psychological causes, personality traits and biology. But what about the spiritual dimension? In the next few minutes, Lorna bridges that gap between body and soul with new insights from medical experts and through firsthand stories from women, including a former Miss America whose struggles took an inspired and inspiring direction. Former Miss America Kirsten Hagland will be joining us shortly, but first, here's Sheldon with In 60. Lorna, each year thousands of teens will develop problems with weight, eating, and body image. But eating disorders are not just about food. They are complex psychological illnesses that affect a person's sense of self-worth. The three most common eating disorders are anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorder. While eating disorders are prevalent the world over, it is women in the Western world who have the highest risk of developing them. Most girls who develop an eating disorder are between 13 and 17 years old, a turbulent time of emotional and psychological changes and social pressures. However, males are not immune and the rate of hospitalization for the treatment of eating disorders in boys and young men has significantly increased. There are many causes of eating disorders including biological factors, psychological abnormalities and cultural influences. Our first guest was crowned Miss America in 2008, but that wasn't until after she'd won another victory, control over an eating disorder. Kirsten Haglin joins us from New Jersey. Welcome to Context. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Kirsten, it was where you were a young, aspiring ballet dancer that you first started to restrict your eating. How does this begin? What caused you to develop an eating disorder? Well, eating disorders are very complex and they start because of a variety of different factors and every person's story is so different. For me, I was 12 years old studying away at a ballet program, a very competitive, intense program, and I wanted to be a ballet dancer more than anything else in the whole world. But I went from being you know, a big fish in a small pond to being one of the best at my studio in Michigan where I grew up to being with professional class dancers. And so the pressure was intense. That summer, my mother was also diagnosed with breast cancer and I had members of my family that started to struggle with other mental health issues. So my world just quickly went from being a great childhood to being very chaotic, coupled with the fact that I was in an environment where the body ideal is incredibly thin and unrealistic for most women. So I thought, well, goodness, my life is kind of crashing down around me. Uh, what can I do to, to control it? And what can I possibly find success and worth and value in when so many other things are going wrong? And so I found my worth in ballet. And when I thought that maybe I couldn't achieve that dream because I wasn't the right size, I took it out of my body. And so I started to diet. And the thing about eating disorders is you think that a diet or losing a few pounds will solve the problem. You'll lose five pounds and you'll be happy, but it's just not the case. It's an insidious disease and five pounds isn't enough. And it just becomes more and more and more restrictive, more dangerous. And it really takes complete control of not only your body, but also your mind and your emotions. You are speaking publicly about eating disorders while competing in beauty pageants, Kirsten. Let's get to the <laughs> heart of this beauty message that says, you have to be thin to be in. How should young women cope with that? Well, every woman is gonna cope and deal with that message differently. And a lot of women feel the pressure to look a certain way, to be a certain weight, even if they're not in the public eye or they're not in a job that requires them to look good. <laughs> um, like TV, like beauty pageants, like modeling, you don't have to be in fashion in order to feel this pressure. Every woman feels that at some point in their life. For me, I was completely recovered from my battle with anorexia when I decided to compete in a pageant. I wanna make that really clear because it's so important to be healed and to be in a good place mentally and emotionally and spiritually before you put yourself in such a triggering situation. But I decided to use the fact that there, were so, there are so many young girls that look up to Miss America, to um, beauty pageant contestants, to celebrities, to models as role models. Whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, they do. 
So I decided to use the platform that I had as Miss America to talk about my own struggle, to show girls that I wasn't perfect, that um, you know I was just an, a normal girl who had struggled with some serious things that had felt you know not good about my body, had felt not confident, all those things, um, and that you don't have to be perfect in order to achieve something in life. And so I tried to use I tried to use that platform to do that. What do you say to the girl who says, look at you, Kirsten, you're thin, you're gorgeous, you're beautiful, you got through it? I was a, a little girl with braces and glasses, and there was a time in my life when I did not have a lot of friends, I was so not the cool girl, I didn't date a lot, that you don't have to follow that perfect, cool path in order to achieve something. There is so much more to fulfillment than appearances. And the girl across the room can look happy and look perfect and look beautiful, but that doesn't mean she's happy on the inside. Because at the time when I was the thinnest in my life, I was the most depressed, I was the most alone and the most unhappy. And I, you, you don't wanna live anymore. But maybe to other people, I looked happy. So it's about much more than what's on the outside. It's truly about what's on the inside. Kirsten, you believe there's a spiritual recovery possible for eating disorders. What what are you what can you explain that for us? Well, my faith was a huge part of my recovery. In fact, I grew up in a faith-based household. My parents took my brother and I to church, but I didn't really have a living faith until I experienced my battle with anorexia. And I truly believe in this life we gain so much perspective, character, and truly a living faith when we go through struggle. That's what some of these hardest battles in life are all about. Kirsten, tell us about you and God. What kind of message did you receive from God? Where was God in your struggle for recovery? It was really just delving into his scripture. I mean, that's the letter that he wrote to all of us. It's in his word, it's in the Bible. It was from those passages that I drew my strength and I learned that I wasn't in this fight alone and that there was hope and there was purpose and a reason for my struggle. And I think that outside of the world of eating disorders, that is something that every single person can relate to. That no matter what darkness you go through in life, there is someone there alongside of you that's gonna walk with you, th walk with you through it and that's, that's what God did with me in my healing, and that's why I learned to rely on Him now throughout whatever challenge I might face. Kirsten, what's your advice today for a person or for a family who's got a loved one going through an eating disorder? The number one piece of advice I can give to any family or young person struggling is to talk about it with someone. If you're a parent and you think your, your child might be struggling, talk to other parents, talk to their school counselor, reach out to a therapist or your church or some other trusted person in your life. If you're a young person, reach out and talk to a friend. Start talking about this issue because when it's kept in the dark and it's kept in silence, that's where the disease can reign and you and healing and recovery will not take place. These things need to be talked about, especially in the church. So go to people that you can trust to talk about what's going on and then get help and reach out and get treatment. There's a wide range of treatment that is available for eating disorders. Um, people just need to ask about it. Go online, Google, I mean, as simple as it sounds, Google eating disorders and treatment and reach out to find resources. They are there. People just need the courage to, to ask. Kirsten, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me and for talking about this incredibly important issue. Kirsten Hagland, former Miss America and public educator on the subject of eating disorders, joined us by Skype in New Jersey. Fresh back from some great research on this subject, here's Sheldon Neal with Fast Facts. Thank you, Lorna. Here are some of the more common signs that someone may have an eating disorder. Often the person will become obsessed with what they eat. They'll express concern about their body size, regardless of their weight. Uh, they might weigh themselves repeatedly. Uh, they may become thin or even emaciated. They withdraw from social activities, uh, perhaps even show signs of depression and lethargy. Um, we have the list behind me, and they might exercise to the excess as well. And they might even feel constantly cold, so quite a list there, Lorna. With us now is Dr. Deborah Katzman. She established the Eating Disorders Program at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Dr. Katzman is currently the Director of Research in the Division of Adolescent Medicine at SickKids. Please welcome Dr. Katzman to Context. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Well, I think you need to help us on uh, this identifying part. How do, we, how do we identify if someone in our, in our families coming coming to grips with an eating disorder? 
So there, there are probably many ways to do this. Um, first of all, uh, young people, uh, the young people that I take care of who uh, have eating disorders often will lose a significant amount of weight, so you might be able to identify it. Um, as was said, um, they d become very, very cold or experience being cold all the time. Um, they uh, have mood shifts, so they can be very, very irritable. They tend to isolate themselves from their friends and their family. Um, often what you see at the dinner table is young people trying to avoid coming to meals and eating. Um, they may play with their food. And so it's very behavioral. You can, these are, it's unusual. What makes a family member susceptible to it? What makes a young person prone? So that's a really complicated question. Um, developing an eating disorder is very complex. Um, there's lots of work right now that have been done uh, looking at the genetics or the biology of eating disorders, and there seems to probably be some genetic predisposition to it. Wow. That doesn't mean that families cause eating disorders. It actually means that young people are vulnerable to it as a result of their genetic makeup. And if you have a vulnerable young person in an environment that we live in where there's a great pressure and stress on being thin or looking a certain way, those two kinds of pressures come together and collide and probably cause an eating disorder. So it's a genetic thing is what you're looking for first. Is there's probably a genetic vulnerability. There isn't a specific gene yet that we've identified, but there's probably a, a genetic makeup, a very complicated, complicated genetic makeup that makes a young person vulnerable to developing this. Not a trauma they may have suffered, not... Um... A well, pickiness is a wee person. Yeah, so, I mean, there are young people who um, have this genetic vulnerability that may have suffered a trauma that sort of unfortunately kicks off the eating disorder. So explain to us then the physical changes that go on in a, in a body when it is suffering an, a, an eating disorder. So a young person can actually have every part of their body affected by an eating disorder. Young people become quite thin and emaciated. Um, in young people, what can happen is that they can actually have changes in their brain structure, and as a result, their brain function or the way they think can be impaired. Young people can have changes to their heart, just like we have muscles and fat on the outside that you see when you restrict yourself and lose weight. The inside of your body changes as well, and so the heart becomes very small. Wow. Your bowels don't work very How well. How long does it take for this to all start to kick in? It can happen as early as two or three months into the illness. Wow. One of the things that You might I've... not even notice somebody has an illness no. in two or three months. No. And but if physically their body is already being affected. That's correct. Is it recoverable? Absolutely. Um, there are many parts of the body, the medical complications that I've just gone over with you, the physical complications that once you renourish the body and give young people nutritional um, rehabilitation, um, they can in fact um, reverse many of the, me the physical side effects that we've talked about. So how do we do treatment? How does a family go about treating this? So, uh, first of all, you have to identify it, and the most important thing is identifying it early. So if there's any suspicion within a family that uh, a young person has an eating disorder, they probably should go to their family physician or pediatrician as soon as possible. Family physicians and pediatricians are often very skilled in identifying eating disorders. If you catch it early enough, you can actually treat young people as an outpatient. And usually the treatment is what we call family-based treatment. So we get the family involved in the treatment to help refeed the young person with an eating disorder. And this is done with a therapist. And the primary therapist supports the family in helping the child get better. You use the word to help refeed. What right. is refeeding? Refeeding means that many young people who have eating disorders are afraid of eating. So they cut back on what they need. And as a result of that, they're not growing and developing normally. Refeeding a young person is giving them the nutrition that they need so that they can indeed grow and develop normally. Is it like, like liquids? Is it like... 
is it? Most of the time, families can refeed their children the kinds of food that they were eating before they got sick. So that's the refeeding process. You, um, we've spoken a lot about families, but sometimes people struggle with this all alone. It's a very quiet, dangerous disease. What do you do if you're all alone on this battle? If you're all alone on this battle, it would, be, you know, lots of people won't necessarily reach out to their family or their friends. Um, one of the things that they can do if they have a trusted um, therapist or a trusted physician, I would encourage them to reach out to people like that, people who are knowledgeable about these illnesses and can help them with these illnesses. These are really, really tenacious illnesses. They're very, very difficult to treat, but people do get better. Dr. Katzman, thank you for this medical perspective. It's a pleasure. Dr. Deborah Katzman is a professor of pediatrics at SickKids Hospital in Toronto. When we come back, you might think eating disorders happen to people in other places. Yet so often the problem is closer to home than you think. And I'll tell you how our production team learned that lesson firsthand. Stay with us. The only thing missing from today's conversation is you. To add your voice, call us at 1-800-215-4913. Email us at comments at contextwithlorna.com or reach us by Facebook or Twitter. We see, hear, read, and value all feedback. Click contextwithlorna.com to access exclusive web resources. Do a topical search on a subject you need to know. There's blogs, articles, links, and previous episodes. Life beyond the headlines. That's contextwithlorna.com. In a moment, proof that people struggling with eating disorders may be just a friend or family member away. But first, here's Sheldon with some fast facts. Thank you, Lorna. Let's look at health problems caused by eating disorders. They can include severe malnutrition, digestive problems and stomach damage, brittle bones and swollen joints, anemia, heart problems, kidney damage, fertility problems, hair loss and tooth decay. Now you can see it's quite a list, I'm sure not exhaustive. Now the Canadian Mental Health Association, Association rather, states that 10% of people who experience anorexia die as a result of health problems or suicide. Well, our studio audience has already met our next guest, Christina Evanoff because she is our audience coordinator at Context. And it was during our production process that Christina did some coaching with us to ensure that we get the story on eating disorders right. Christina, welcome to this side of the camera. Thank you so much. Okay, well we shouldn't Hi. shake hands. We do I know, hug I here. Like I should yeah. hug you. Yeah, we should. <laughs> You know, Christina, it's a really big decision to speak publicly about any mental health issue. Why do you want to speak out on this subject of eating disorders? Um, I think because of my experience and my journey with eating disorders, I feel like I have a responsibility to say something and um, maybe it will help other young girls. That's something I wish I had when I was younger, someone that would have told me the truth about it and helped me see before I had to go through everything I went through. So I feel like I didn't go through that for nothing and I want to share it and I'm excited too because it's a celebration actually of Because you of are my so life. healthy. I'm but, healthy, but, I'm but happy, let's, yes. let's go back, let's go back. When okay. did you first struggle with an eating disorder? Um, I think the mindset of an eating disorder came far before the actual physical eating disorder of starving myself. And um, I remember being six years old the first time I felt fat, I felt self-conscious about my body weight. And it was just from, you know, a comment from someone of, you know, innocent comment of uh, that I had a stomach or I was chubby. I don't remember exactly, but I remember at that age picking that up as part of my identity. And, um, and you dieted as a little girl, as a grade two girl. Yeah, grade two I put myself on a diet, which is far too young for any child to be 
on a diet. But I, I did that on my own initiative. I felt I had to. I felt it would make me better and happier, even at that age. So You got very serious with your um, body image issues mm -hmm. in grade 9, and you lost way too much weight. It's your first big plunge into anorexia. Right. And I love it that your grandmother said you didn't look good. Yeah, she was actually... Um, the first person to speak up in my life. I had lost 40 pounds in grade nine. Um, what started as just I thought I was dieting and exercising became more and more extreme um, until it was an obsession and it really took over my grade nine year. And um, unfortunately, I had a lot of positive feedback for it. A lot of people saying, you know, you look great, you've lost weight, um, what have you been doing? And um, it took a long time before people started to be concerned and say, wait a minute, are you okay? Are you eating right? Are you healthy? And my, my grandmother was always a very bold woman, and she was the first one to say, what are you doing to yourself? And what happened in your mind when Grandma spoke to you? It woke me up. It was the first time that someone had said something negative about this. I thought this was great. I thought I was doing something very positive for myself, I think. And um, it but, shocked me because her opinion mattered a lot to me. And so you, mm -hmm. you, you, you recovered to a degree, but by grade 12, yeah. your eating disorder is back. And it's back so badly that you had to be hospitalized. Yeah, that was a very hard time for myself and my family, and it, it was a severe thing, and I felt like it was something I couldn't have pulled myself out of on my own. I definitely needed love and support from others, and um, most importantly, the love of God really affected me. And when I experienced the love of God, it was, it was the greatest form of kindness. It was the opposite of everything I had been experiencing within that struggle. It really woke me up and made me realize what life is. You, as we were talking about this story off camera, you mm -hmm. told us about a psalm that was very important to you. Psalm 139. Yeah, Psalm 139 talks about how we are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. And, and David goes on to say it that, um, and my soul, I know that deep within my soul, I carry that knowledge. And I think for me, learning that and carrying that knowledge that I am beautifully made by God. And it doesn't matter what the media says. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what anyone says because he made me and he's truth and he tells me I'm beautiful. What advice have you got for us if, if someone is struggling with an eating disorder? The most important thing is, that I learned from that is that it doesn't matter what you do to try to make yourself feel more beautiful or more worthwhile or more lovely. Um, those things don't lead to that. But if you could step back and believe that just as you are right now is enough and it's beautiful enough and it's great, then... Um, that deep acceptance that God has for us, regardless what culture is saying. Yeah, exactly. Then you're going to be actually happy and you're going to actually feel alive and that life is going to make you feel beautiful. So. Christina, thank you very much. Don't go away. Okay. Uh, we're going to just go to Sheldon now, who's got someone in our studio audience for a comment about this. Thank you so much, Lorna. I'm actually here with Kim Duffy. And Kim, you are the founder, director of the Waterstone Eating Disorder Clinic in Toronto. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my question to you is, uh, how does a family member help their own when they discover that someone within their own circle, their own family, is struggling with an eating disorder? Um both parents have to understand. Uh, a lot of times it will be the mother that's the one getting all the information, the one that's going to the appointments. But it's both that they have to work together. They're going to need a lot of support um, to get through it. And that it's not a quick fix. It's not something that's going to happen right away, that it's going to take some time. So, But there's definitely hope and uh, recovery. So, uh, Lord, I think we actually have a further comment as yes. well. It's important to recognize where on the continuum of the eating disorder the person is. There are times when they're in such a state that being in a hospital facility is the very best and working in tight partnership with your pediatrician and your doctor is important to make sure they're stabilized and they're well. At other points, they may be able to move into a facility where they can 
work more on the cognitive features of the illness because the nutrition is a little more restored. And so it's really important to match that treatment to the child or the person that's going through the eating disorder. Thank you both right. for those comments, Lorna. Christina, thank you for telling us your story. Thank you for having me. All right, Christina Evanov is our audience coordinator at Context. Thank you very much, Christina. When we come back, my learning curve on the topic of eating disorders. Why just watch Context when you can be part of it? To join our live studio audience in Toronto's CBC Broadcasting Centre, give us a call at 416-599-9777, extension 58, or email us at tickets at contextwithlorna.com. Click contextwithlorna.com to access exclusive web resources. Do a topical search on a subject you need to know. There's blogs, articles, links, and previous episodes. Life beyond the headlines. That's contextwithlorna.com. The only thing missing from today's conversation is you. To add your voice, call us at 1-800-215-4913. Email us at comments at contextwithlorna.com or reach us by Facebook or Twitter. We see, hear, read, and value all feedback. This segment is brought to you by Bruce Etherington and Associates. Family harmony and philanthropy helping you help others. It moves me that it was young women who knocked on our production door and said, you have to do a program on eating disorders. And I think this was at the root of it. They were girls who knew they were deeply loved by God, and they were girls who had seen that an eating disorder can block that truth. These been there, done that champions of eating disorder recovery showed us how God gives good wisdom to enable medical professionals and therapists to help. The girls showed us the power of spiritual healing, of the turning point of helping people know that God loves them and how the Bible equips the rest of us with surprising tools to help. Listening, for instance, and helping others meet the God who offers a foundation of love and acceptance for each person. So write to us if you need some help. We have a team who will answer all of the email from today's program. And you can find great links and book suggestions for help with eating disorders on our website at contextwithlorna.com. So for all of us, I'm Lorna Duick. Thanks for watching and join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. topic that we don't talk about enough. Um, I think with the rise of mental health issues in our society, we're slowly eradicating that stigma of this is not something to talk about, but especially as a female, I have friends who have been touched, um, who have struggled with eating disorders, um, working on a university campus. I can tell you that that's still very prevalent, but it's not something that we talk about. So the fact that you know, a whole show, a whole show is dedicated to it, but also looking at the fact that there's resources out there and letting us know where we can go for help, where we can direct people for help, uh, that's, so, that's so important. I really appreciated the fact that we were able to learn there were definitely facts um, concerning eating disorders and also enjoyed the fact that there was a personal story that we could actually identify with and um, learn more from a personal perspective and I think um, that having those two perspectives both um, statistics and a personal point of view um, it definitely makes it easier for young women to identify number one and I think number two feels safe enough to bring it up and, and for people to just understand have a deeper understanding about the issue.